This program is made possible by the loyal financial support of the friends and partners of Family Policy Institute. Welcome to the program, thank you for joining us. We're sitting in the beautiful gardens at the Vineyard Hotel in Claremont and my guest is Musi Maimani, the former leader of the DA. Musi, welcome, thank you for speaking to us. It is my great privilege and honor and thank you for having us and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So, so Musi, uh, since you resigned from the DA as the DA's federal leader uh, in October last year, uh, many people have been contacting me and asking, so what's happening to Musi? Is there a new political party on the horizon? Um, and, and a number of questions that I obviously couldn't answer. And I thought the best way to answer all of these questions is to interview you, to speak to you on camera, to hear what is God saying to Musi Maimani? What is your vision for the future for you and your family? And more importantly, what is your future for South Africa. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Errol. And uh, suffice to say, all of us are driven fundamentally by not only a love for God, but a love for our great nation. Yes. And uh, when, I, when I was finishing a journey at the DA, which um, I must be honest, gave me an opportunity to serve our country, uh, I then had to reflect deeply about how I felt this nation needed to go. And one of the things that were crucial, even at the time of transition, I always felt at the time that there are many South Africans who are silent. There are many South Africans who are left out and that they're not being spoken to or certainly not organized. There isn't a movement in this country that is able to actually not only hold politicians accountable, but able to actually represent citizens in this country. I mean, I'm animated by a simple dream, which is that men and women of different races can work together, prosper together, and live together peacefully. That's what I think South Africa must be. Yes. That's, but to achieve that, it became very clear that we ha a, have a toxic political system, that we live in two South Africas. We live in a South Africa where if you have money, you can get good health care and a good education. And if you don't have money, um, those things become very difficult. So, so Musi, if I can just get in there. So are you saying then, you know, being the leader of political, uh, it's the second largest political party in the country for five years, um, you resigned. Is it because you don't believe the par current political landscape is not accurately and fairly representing the hopes and aspirations of the South African people? Well, and, and therein lies the, the great difficulties that I felt that we've got 48 political parties in this country. So when I left the DA, I was very, very clear about the fact that it was distancing. It, political parties were distant from people. Our public representatives, epitomized by what takes place at the State of the Nation Address, are having their own inter-conversations and forgotten about citizens. So I said, let's go out and form a movement for all South Africans. I felt God say that to me, and that's what began the journey, because one... So you're I, saying, sorry, a non-political movement? Correct. A, 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 a sense at grassroots... Which, Correct. people focused movement yeah. that is not politically aligned in any way and i felt i felt that because that was absolutely crucial for me because i said south africans can unite on many things but there are also many things that divide us but i want us to focus on five things as a movement the first one was obviously this issue of electoral reform because whether i like it or not the people who we elect we elect parties who give us people we don't elect people. Yes. So in essence, anyone can stand as a front for anything and the people that come behind them, you don't know them. And because I'd had such vast experience in parliament, I'd looked at the Fancel Slabet report, the idea that we could split South Africa into constituencies, and that so it be that one day we could directly elect someone who can represent us in parliament. So when you say it isn't political, it isn't political in a party sense, it is, when you talk about electoral reform, really genuinely looking to 
reform the political system in this country. Okay, so we have now a case that was taken to the, or challenge that was taken to the Constitutional Court. It was heard last year, August. Uh, the ruling must still be handed down. Yeah. But that is basically challenging the current Electoral Act, saying that independent candidates must have a right to stand without having to join a political party. Correct. So they can represent the people directly. Is that what you, you're talking about? And I endorse that court case. I've been following it uh, carefully. And we've been engaging uh, even the respective organizations that have uh, become applicants in that matter. But the hard work will begin after the judgment because yes. subsequent to the judgment, the electoral act must be rewritten so that it can achieve the sense upon which it doesn't become the same version just, uh, just with a few adjustments here and there. Yes. But actually, the direct hard work of saying, how do we directly elect people? But not only that, how do we directly remove people? Because at this point in time, it's, it's, it might be the starting point to say, I will elect so-and-so in this community to represent me. But democracy cannot just rely on five-year cycles. I can't just wait for the next five years and then say, hopefully we'll get this person in out. That's right. We must get to a point where we say, actually, no, we've had, you've had time. You're not being measured according to these criteria, which the movement will prescribe, and then say, actually, we think you should be removed, or actually, we think you're the best person. And so by use of technology and being the Uber, if you think about your Uber driver, you rate them all the time. You are giving them five star or three star. Why aren't we doing that to politicians so that they know yeah. people are rating? So, so Musi, do you then believe that if the constitutional court rules in favor of the applicants, and that is to rework the electoral act so that independent candidates can stand in constituencies around South Africa, making it possible then for people to directly re, re, uh, elect a representative yeah. and send that representative to parliament, which is answerable now to those people. Not like the current political system where the political parties, the members in those parties are accountable to the party leader, the party boss, and not necessarily to the people. Do you believe if the, if the court rules in, in favor of that, uh, that it will be a game changer for South Africa? Completely. It will reform our politics because not only will it begin to address the question of even something like race relations, because at this point in time, we're heading down the path where political parties are either for black people or white people or a particular faith or whatever. That, I think, is, begun, is becoming more divisive. Rather, we need to bring it down to say, actually, let's pick men and women of integrity. Let's pick men and women who share a vision for our country and let them be prepared to go represent us and that the interests of the people be the first in their minds. Yes. And I think it'll change the entire game. I think it'll be important for South Africans. And finally, because if we just keep doing what we're doing, we'll get what we've always got, which is state capture and the many issues that we've raised, and yes. corruption, etc. Whereas I think if we reform that, not only will it break that back, it will allow for citizens to directly know who's accountable to them. Okay, so your movement that you're busy uh, nurturing at the moment, uh, what is it called? And, and is this sort of preparation for this change in the electoral system where you're going to prepare candidates, people to stand as candidates and maybe train them for how to re represent the people rather than a party boss. We're calling it the One South Africa movement or the movement for One South Africa and because the idea of one is crucial for me. Uh, it's about, it's not only about non-racialism but it's also about economic inclusion, it's about justice and it's about focusing on the future. And I think if we can agree on those things, we can unite. And part of the work that we've got to do is to build an accountable government. I, I think there are incredible South Africans out there. I think that many of them may not know how the workings of government, that will require training. Yes. But I do think at their hearts, at their core, they want to be able to stand and represent citizens. And we've got to give them the best opportunity to be able to do so. Yeah. So, so you, do you think there's a lot of talented people with a great burden for this nation wanting to serve the people of this country, but they're standing out there, they're saying, we don't want to be part of a political party. We see what we see on television. We don't want to be part of that. But yet we want to represent the people of this country. So if the electoral system is changing our country, it's going to allow for all of these people to step up and, and 
you know, fulfill their destiny. Completely. And I think it will become a great pipeline for great South Africans to be able to serve in that way, who may be not wanting to be affiliates of any political party in that sense, but also will be able to create a popular mandate amongst people. Because in one community, in one constituency, you may very well find there may be two or three people who are that talented. That's where democracy gets tested. That's where actually citizens themselves can say, no, we think we have a choice between so and so and so and so. We're spoiled for choice. We're going to vote for the best person. And once the best person is available to us, then everybody must rally behind them. Then you're not stuck with parties having to tell you, no, it doesn't matter what your view is. We've decided on this policy and this is your person. Yeah, and that's currently what's happening and it's, it's worrying a lot of people in this country. So Musi, you've been in politics for a while, uh, a leader of the second largest political party. Uh, you grew despondent and you resigned from the DA. So, so give us maybe just a... a just your heart on why you left, why you thought, okay, this is it. I can't fulfill my vision for this country while being the leader of this party. I, you know, I'll tell you a story. One day I went to, I was in parliament and while I was, while I was in parliament, there was a march on gender-based violence outside parliament. I attended that and it represented really a genuine sin in our country. Like, I mean, I think anyone who takes violence against women is committing a great evil. Absolutely. And uh, there were a lot of women outside Parliament who were very angry. And I remember the President came to speak at that. And I, I, I walked, and I was walking, I was speaking to the President, I said, Mr. President, you know, in truth, I, I think citizens out there are angry and no one is gonna be able to speak to them. I think the thing that discouraged me from that moment, it was like, it was when I was speaking to him, and I'm not trying to discourage the President, I felt he walked away and thought, well, we've got to find a political solution to this. And I just thought, whoa, your problem is that there are citizens who are disengaged. When I looked at the 2019 elections, it became quite clear that the party that grew the biggest was the no vote party. The thing that keeps me awake at night is young people who are in and of themselves not uh, engaged in the politics. They are not registered, but they are not working. More than half the young people in this country are not working. And no political party will have an ability to speak to them, to speak to the women outside parliament, to speak to those who are left out. And I just became more and more aware of the growing anger and resistance towards the political system. But worse than that, the silence that has been produced by, I mean, when I think about church communities, and I want to speak to honestly to citizens out there, I sometimes wonder why the church is sometimes so silent about such crucial matters. There yes. are young, young kids being murdered, and I feel there's a silence in the church sometimes. And that needs to be awakened. That, the, that the civil society, NGOs, church, faith-based communities, it needs to be awakened. Because actually, if we genuinely believe in democracy, then we must get back to saying it is by the people and for the people. And at this point in time, it's by the parties, for the parties. So, so Musi, um, why do you think there is the silence in the church? Because a lot of people talk about it. When I travel around this country and I speak at churches, I meet with people and it's the same complaint. There's so much happening in our country that the church should be speaking to, providing leadership in areas like gender-based violence and all kinds of other things, but they're not doing that. So I, I want to hear your heart on what you believe is the problem there and how we can maybe fix that, that number one. Number two, um, there was a prophecy that was doing the rounds last year that was made in the United States of, in, of America in a church in California. The man didn't know about you, but he had this MM and he said, there's a man that God is going to use to bring about change in South Africa. You've seen that prophecy. Uh, I want your heart on what you believe that prophecy is saying and what you believe God is saying to you. Uh, especially for the next couple of years where we're heading in this country, what God is saying specifically to you uh, in, in the context of that prophecy that was made. So we've run out of time now. When we come back after the break, I'd like you to address those issues. Welcome back to the program. I'm speaking to Musi Maimani, the previous leader of the Democratic Alliance in Parliament, actually the national leader, 
Musi resigned in October last year and is now starting a grassroots movement, a people movement called One South Africa Movement. One South Africa Movement, and we're going to speak more about that. So Musi, in the previous segment, we were talking about the prophecy that was made over your life. And, and it did say that this MM, the guy didn't know your name, he just said MM. He thought it was MM, the rapper in the United <laughs> yeah, States. Yeah, yeah. And then later on, he found out that there is a man named Musi Maimani in South Africa that is a political leader. And he said, God is saying this man God is going to use to bring about change in the nation. So you know about that prophecy. You've resigned as a political leader and you're starting a movement. So what do you think God is saying to you, your heart? One is when I, when I heard that word, uh, I mean, it's, I always treat prophecy in the same light. I kind of go, well, it's God's word and we have a responsibility to be obedient to it. And so I don't, I feel very called to this country. I will, we will give our lives as a family to, to this nation. And, and we really are trusting God that in his word, in his timing, he'll bring it to pass. So, um, I, and I certainly, it served as a great encouragement because there are days in your political journey that are dark. There are days where yes. you want to give up. Sometimes it's good to say, but God said. Um, and then that's always a reminder, along with many other people. We've got South Africans who are praying for us, praying, praying for, 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 for our own journey personally, but for our country. And I think it's, it's a, and, and one of the things that encouraged me, even when I left the DIA, someone sent me a prophetic word that they hadn't published yet that said there'd be a new movement. And we feel that we hadn't been speaking, we hadn't been like in contact. They just, and, and so we feel this is not just cleverness or trying to do anything. It's about really reigniting a movement in this country. And I think not only is it about a question of direct uh, election, but it's also a question of activism. Uh, we were speaking a little bit about the church and I, and I always say that not only should the church be vocal in the role that Nathan played to David, but it also be active in the role that simply says, hey, if there's a local clinic in our community that's not working, can we as a local church just go out there and say, in the name of Christ, we want to work in this local clinic, without feeling that the walls of the church are the parameters of influence, but actually that society in general mm. is the space church can influence in. And so we really want to get back to that and bring in activism. And if you look at our history, our history is, has got an incredible testimony to what the church was able to do. If you yes. think about pre-1994, yeah. there was an active movement of church leaders. In fact, if I think about the ANC itself, it was founded by a lot of church leaders who said, hey, we, we reject racism, we reject that injustice, we can do something. Now the question is, I think there's been a diffusion as to what's happening in our country. And I want to remind people in our church, more than half our people in this country are living below the poverty line. I want to remind people that actually in our country, we're a country that is, has a higher murder rate than a country at war. And if we don't realize that those, that is an injustice and that the political system is broken, we need to recognize that we need to get back. We need to get back to a sense of activism and we need to work together to be able to say, can we bring the change? And when you say we, you're talking about the Church of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Because yeah. The, you know, the last census they did, um, I think it's 78.9% of South Africans self-identified as Christian. Now, this is a large demographic in this country. Uh, many people are saying the reason South Africa is experiencing the problems they are experiencing is there's a lack of leadership, good leadership, visionary leadership in politics. But that shouldn't be the same in the church because we know what the challenges are. We have the solutions in God's word but we don't seem to be applying it. So there's silence in the church. What do you think is the reason for that silence? Uh, I mean, my, my, and, I, and I come from a church background, so I, I, I want to be clear that I, I speak to it as one would speak to uh, something they love. You know? So it's not, it's not out of critique or it's, yes. it's out of really a genuine... Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a, You're you a member correct. of the church. Yeah, exactly. I'm a member of a church. It's 80% 80, 80 of citizens just thereabouts would identify as Christian, which means the voice must be louder. But I think there are a couple of things that, that they, I think people perish because of a lack of vision. Therefore, as a natural outcome, I think that often the church doesn't have, may have a vision for the church with a small C, but doesn't have a vision of the country. Yes. And be able to articulate it. What, what, what kind of economic model? There, there must be economists sitting in the church 
who are searching. I mean, I, when I think about the story of Joseph, I think here's a person who came up with an economic model for the time that transitioned yes. a nation. Exactly. So I often think that we have a vision for just what happens in the four walls on a Sunday, but we don't always have a vision for our community, our streets, our neighborhood. So that's one. The second thing is I think as a result of institutionalized church, some of it has become politically captured. You see politicians go and speak at churches. Yes. And often those church leaders are kind of like, okay, we will endorse this regardless of what's going on. In fact, many of our leaders, in fact, even the former president would stand up and say, I'm a church person. And therefore, there's a sense upon which you almost can mute the church. Because once the church and politics become one, I can understand the dangers that emerge from there. So I think that has been a progressive progress, a progressive issue since 1994 that sought to silence the church. And one of the things I want to caution against, I heard that other people were making a call that the president must have a minister of religion. I thought that's the worst idea possible yes. because all that will do is will co-opt the church even more so, introduce silence, and before you know it, the church and the government are one, and it fails the role of Nathan being able to challenge the David. That's right. So what I would urge for going forward is let's articulate a vision. Let's We're not going to agree on everything, but let's articulate a vision. For me, I think if we can agree on just that inclusive economy, what does that look like? If we can agree on the fact that we could live in a country one day where women would be able to walk around freely and safely, that will mean we must bring police closer to people. If we can be able to hold our public representatives accountable, if we can be able to say, well, what, what future do we see for our country? What tomorrow? So that every young person is able to be a digital citizen because that's the world we're going to live in. And that we can look after the climate uh, so that we're not ignorant of that. I know that uh, there might be a theology that says we must ignore climate change. I'm not necessarily sub sub subscribing to all of it, but I think if we can look after, we can be real stewards of yes. what our environment is. We can then work together for the future of our country. And that requires church communities, civil society, and even uh, organizations, because that in that way, we can provide leadership to society. Okay, so your movement, um, One South Africa movement, is going to be that movement that will bring people together and begin to explain how we can, as South Africans, regardless of race, color, and creed, and faith, and all of those things, work together to build a better South Africa for all people. So it's a grassroots movement, not politically aligned. However, if the Constitutional Court makes this ruling and changes the Electoral Act so that independent candidates can stand to better and more directly represent their people, there's going to be training for people so that they can stand and, and, and be the representatives, true representatives of people. Absolutely. And even beyond that, not only just representing us in Parliament, why don't we get school principals who represent values that can be able, because in our schools today, there are certain values that have been taken out because we've got bad leadership there. That's right. What happens in uh, our own churches, what happens in our own communities, what happens in the, in the local police station, what values need to come in there. So, so ultimately, governance and its infrastructure can't <coughs> just be simply reduced to what happens in Parliament. That has a role for particular people. There can only be 400 members of Parliament. But we have leaders beyond 400 because we're saying, you come help us run our town. Come help us deal with local government. Let's, let's, let's be able to have ambassadors that can be able to go out into communities and be able to mm. be influencers. Talking about local government, I, I read an article that uh, a certain municipality that's fallen apart because of corruption and all kinds of issues and are not getting the services, the court has ruled that uh, you know, people have to come in and take over running that municipality uh, and suspending the actual... ANC government, local government there so that people can correct what was happening yeah. in that. So if that happens, start happening around the country, your movement would be well placed and you know, strategically positioned to be able to step into those gaps where there's a failure of government and a people's movement stepping in, being trained to take over and govern our nation properly. And not only is it about human cap capability, but it's also about the use of technology. Yes. You know, if you're very deliberate about accountability, not, not, if you know, if our citizens, I said to them, do you know how much your, your municipality spends on X? People don't know. And I, and I hate to say this, but it is true. I think local government capture will make state capture at uh, SOEs look like a picnic. 
because local municipalities all around have been looted at a point upon which we don't have a clue what is going on. So when you go to towns, you know, I, over the January period, I drove from KZN to Cape Town. And it gave me an opportunity to see just along the end two towns I'd visited in and out. But when you see them cumulatively, you start to realize that from Butterworth to Queenstown to um, uh, East London to PE to Makana to Grahamstown, all of those towns are in a state of disrepair. Yes. And it tells you that that's where the rubber hits the road. That's where people have to get water, electricity, basic services. Those things have collapsed. We have to build a movement that can get people back into those spaces, bring out a level of, of accountability and competence and say, let's focus on the future. Let's get the job done because now we're beyond the point. That's why this movement must be beyond politics. It must bring on more people because we are beyond the point where we can sit here and say, well, your side of the boat is leaking. The boat is sinking. That's so right. let's get together and be able to say, let's plug the holes, plug the holes. and begin to set... Yeah. set Somebody up. said that uh, if we don't all um, build together, we're going to sink together. Correct. And, and that is true because Correct. if our economy collapses because of ESCOM, then every South African suffers as a result of that. It's not just a certain sector of, of South African society. It's everybody is in this together. So. This movement, I think, is, is necessary, Musi, and I'm, I'm glad you're sharing this information with me. So tell us a little bit how you're going to roll this out. When is, is there going to be a launch and you know, who can join the movement, how you become part of it, all of those things? We're engaging various stakeholders and I've been traveling to all nine provinces. As you know, we are, we've been doing some work. In fact, yesterday I met with the Western Cape and uh, I know the various provinces are setting up their structures. I was, I've been in KZN, I've been in the Eastern Cape and Gauteng over this weekend and in the Northwest, hopefully. Uh, and what we want to do is be able to have people in their own communities establish councils. They can be part. We'll be, at, we'll be a digital platform as much. And so people can be able to register there and say, I want to participate in the movement. And then furthermore, once you've registered, you'll be able to get a newsletter from me on a regular basis that will give you an update as to what's happening. Uh, the membership of the movement is free, but it must be obviously funded and mobilized by the people. So we've given them the right to be able to say, you can raise your own local funding, be able to run your programs around these particular issues. And then lastly, I think we'll be looking at launching closer to the end of March so that uh, on that weekend, we can gather together, share with people, this is where it's at. These are, this is where they can get all the information and their packs. And for us, we believe that uh, that circle is the most important symbol we can put to South Africa, that it's one South Africa. It's one South Africa. No leader, the people are leading this movement. Absolutely. And uh, hopefully, uh, we're going to see some turnaround in this country. There's a lot of people praying, as you know, Musi, for this country. They're praying for leaders to emerge. You're one of the people that, that people are looking up to, to lead in the area of the restoration, revival of South Africa. And uh, we pray God's blessing on your efforts and may God lead you with wisdom, your family. And uh, we pray that we will see a better South Africa in the near future. So thanks for talking to us. Thank you Bless so much. You. I really appreciate it.